morning everyone so we're in for a treat here we're gonna now look at how Bohr arrived at his theory that electron energy levels in particular for hydrogen are found in specific states it's an interesting story because he basically made up an equation a theory that he had no physical basis for making but it worked or at least it worked for hydrogen and that was important later quantum theory a few decades later finally took what Bohr did refined it and was able to explain from um, spectra especially for more complicated atoms in other words atoms with more than one electron in it but this is a starting point and it's a really interesting problem that gets pretty detailed so there's a lot of derivation here so I'm going to try to get through the first page in the 15 minutes I have and then I'll do the second page in a follow-up tutorial Okay, so we need some background to understand why Bohr did what we did. So it all centers around a spectrum for a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom is simply one proton surrounded by one electron. And if you look at this diagram here, I know yours is in black and white, you will see that there's a continuous spectrum from blue to red, but hydrogen would show, I think, specific lines for specific colors. And so we want to explain this as physicists, and this had been known in the 19th century. Okay, so a certain physicists, a guy named Balmer, Wyman, Passion, and you may remember those names from chemistry, okay, um, they followed the lines, followed a specific pattern. Again, this was for hydrogen, hydrogen only, all right? And it was this equation here. They could basically say, if you take one over the wavelength of that particular line, right, that's the color, it equals some number r, and then multiply by one over n squared minus over one minus one over small n squared, where n and little n are just integers, two and three, four and five. And the r was called the Rydberg constant. The interesting thing is, even though this equation could reproduce the spectral lines for not only what we see here, but also into the infrared and, and um, ultraviolet, and that's why different series of uh, different physicists gave rise to different series, which go towards the uh, ends, no one could explain the physical basis for this. Not even Rutherford, when he did the gold foil experiment, came up with the nuclear model. And no one knew what the meaning of R was. It was just a constant that held it all together. So Bohr comes along in the early 19-teens, right, early 20th century, and he attacks this problem, and this is important. He's attacked it from a quasi-quantum approach. In other words, he mixed classical physics with quantum physics. And to Bohr's credit, he didn't have an issue with the quantum ideas that were coming out of the first decade of the 20th century. Planck's idea, uh, Einstein's idea, Bohr was never really hampered by the old school approach. He said, hey, we know this quantum seem, thing seems to be real, let me apply it to an atom. Because if you really think about this, spectral lines are quantized, they're discrete values, they're not a continuous one, so that would imply there's something going on in the atom that needs to be quantized, okay? And so he said it's got to be something about the orbits since he's simply... Um, since that is what explains what the uh, spectral lines is. So he needs something to be quantized about the orbits. And then what does he look at? What quantities can be quantized? We already know it's energy, but orbits are about moving around in a circle. And what property do objects have when they move around a circle? They have velocity, they're accelerating, they do have kinetic energy, have potential energy, but they also have angular momentum. And that's what he focused on. As he said, without any physical basis for saying that, angular momentum must be quantized in a, uh, any electron orbits. So he took that idea and ran with it. So this is what our derivation is going to do. What if we quantize angular momentum and apply it to electrostatic forces that hold an electron to a proton? Okay, so let's recall from last year. What is the equation for angular momentum when you have a mass about uh, an orbit, right? So I've got some central mass, I've got another mass orbiting around. How do you calculate the angular momentum? Okay, so I mean, there's different versions we learned last year. You remember, maybe you learned that L is equal to I times omega, but we're going to do it in terms of linear quantities, and we're going to transform the I omega into the momentum of the object, mv, 
cross product to the radius or just MVR. Okay, so that is the linear way of looking at angular momentum. So applied to the Bohr, to hydrogen, Bohr's equation became this. He basically said MVR, that's the angular momentum, has to be quantized, so there's got to be an N in there, where N is essentially the energy level, one, two, three, four, etc. That's your quantum part. And then H over 2 pi. Okay, where did he get that from? I don't know. I think he just pulled it out of thin air, or maybe it worked. He knew Planck's constant had to figure in, and we're going to show how this comes in in the next tutorial. Okay, so by doing quantizing angular momentum, it also leads to the quantization of the radius of the orbit, the orbital radius, and more importantly, what we're ultimately after, the energy levels, which we already established. So how do we do that? Okay, so I'm gonna do two derivations here. One leads to the other. You've got a lot of space here. I'm just gonna to go to a new sheet because um, I'm gonna need a lot of space. Okay, so we're gonna start off with the Rn, right? How do we come up with an equation that predicts what the orbital radius of an electron is, the actual value? So again, this is where the quasi uh, semi-classical comes in. He's gonna treat that electron as a traditional orbit. So there is a centripetal force that's causing it to accelerate centripetally, and that's gonna equal mv squared over r, okay? So we did the same derivation last year with planetary orbits. So the only difference is well, how we treat the fc and the v. So let's start with the v. So he's gonna take that quantized angular momentum and solve for v in this case. So if you take the equation that I have in the box above, I know it's not on this page, we can see that v is equal to n times h whoops, over 2 pi, and if I move the m r over the other side, 1 over m r. Okay, I'm just going to separate that out, but you can combine that all. Okay, so and what's the centripetal force? Well, again, if we have a nucleus with an electron going around and around, that's Coulomb attraction. So that follows Coulomb's law. So that's kqq over r squared. But we're going to, instead of, since we know it's the charge of an electron and charge of a proton, which are the same charge, the elementary charge, we're not going to call them q. We're going to call them e. So there's our kr electrostatic constant, e squared, right? That's q times q, all over r squared, OK? So that's Coulomb's law right there. That's going to equal mv squared over r. And now I'm going to substitute this into here. OK? And we're going to big mess. So we're going to get equals. Um, actually, I'm not, not going to do that yet. All right, I'm just looking at my notes here. So let me solve for r first, because that's what we're after. And then we'll substitute into v. So if I cross multiply, I do some algebra. I will see that the radius of the orbit is equal to the Planck's or the Coulomb's constant times the charge of the electron and proton squared um, divided by mv squared. Okay, now I can substitute in what we have for v down into here. And I'm probably going to do a second step just to uh, save some time here. Okay, so since I'm dividing by v squared, all, all these terms are going to flip over when I do that. So that becomes ke squared. That's not going to change. And now I have my substitution. I get 4 pi squared, right? That's the 2 pi squared right up there, okay, times m uh, r squared. Now, I'm not squaring the m. So I'm trying to show you where I'm coming from, right, and when I'm, since I'm doing it in one step. So I have m r squared. I'm squaring this term right here. But since there's an m right there, it, one of them cancels out, but the r's don't cancel out, over n squared uh, r, or, excuse me, h squared. OK, so I'm almost done. Only problem is I have r on this side of the equation. I have r on this side of the equation. So I know this r is going to cancel out with one of these r's. So let me rewrite it to give the final result. And this is not in your reference tables. You're not going to have to memorize it, but we're going to use this to our next derivation. So we can say the radius, depending on the, the, the energy state, right? That's our quantum number, the first level, the second level, et cetera, is simply equal to n squared. So there's your uh, quantum level times h squared all over ke squared 4 pi squared m. 
Okay, so that's pretty interesting. So you can excite electrons at different energy levels, one, two, three, four, etc., and the radius will correspond to that by this quantum value. And again, it worked. Now, the reason I'm doing this derivation again is so now we can come up with the energy levels, which we already talked about, and which can explain that interesting equation that Balmer and Passion and Lyman discovered uh, decades earlier. Okay, so I'm going to go over, actually, I'm going to try to fit it right here. So in order to figure out the electron energy in, in an orbit, it's similar to what we did with planets in orbit. The energy in that system is the sum of the two types of energy, which is potential energy, in this case electric potential energy, plus kinetic energy. Okay, so the, again, the total energy of that electron in its orbit is the sum of these two. So we just got to calculate each one in turn. So let's take the kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. All right, now we're going to do a little mathematical trick here. We're going to relate this to our centripetal force. If we go back to, see if I can scroll up, this equation right here, right, the general generic equation for any centripetal force, we see that there's an mv squared in there. So I can do a little tweaking, and I can say, look at 1 half mv squared is really just equal to, right, 1 half, so I'm going to 1 half, my centripetal force times r. Okay? So you need to convince yourself of that, but look at If I move the, this r over to here, and I multiply it by 1 half, and multiply this by by 1 half, I've got 1 half mv squared here, and I've got what I just put over here. And we'll see why that's helpful later. Okay, so if I substitute in um, the centripetal force, this becomes my kinetic energy is going to be one half. Now, what is my centripetal force? Again, that's Coulomb's law, so that's K E squared all over R squared times R, so that just ends up to be one R there. So there is our expression for the kinetic energy in terms of the charges of uh, the electron and proton and the orbital distance, and that's where this is going to come in. Now, potential energy. Well, if you recall, the potential energy, in, uh, you don't have to write this down, electrostatic potential, actually, I don't know why I'm using PE, let's stick with U. If you go to your reference tables, you can see where this comes from, okay? But U is nothing more than the charge in question, the electron charge, times its potential, electric potential, and electric potential is K, Q, Q in this case is E, this case of the proton, all over R. So look that up if you don't remember that. So anyway, our potential energy is a negative value because we have a negative, uh, one of the charges is negative, K, E squared, all over R. So our total energy, which is Ke plus U, is 1 half Ke squared over R plus negative Ke squared all over R. And if you do the math, you get negative 1 half Ke squared all over R. That negative is significant. If you recall last year for planetary orbits, to have a negative total energy means you're bound, okay, which we expect. An atom is bound to... Uh, the proton. That's what makes it a system. Okay, now we can bring in the derivation from the uh, orbital radius. And I'm running out of time quickly here, so I've got to make this quick. Okay, so now we can substitute in this value right here into this value right here. And I'm going to try to do that with minimize the algebra for you. Okay, you can work that out. So I'm going to say my total energy is equal to negative 4 pi squared. Okay, all I'm doing is substituting in the r value all over 2. That's the 2 that comes from here. All right, k squared e to the fourth m over n squared h squared. Okay, again, I've taken this r here, this whole thing, and substituted in this r, and I'm simplifying. So I just do one more step. Okay, the 4 over 2 becomes 2, so this becomes negative 2 pi squared, k squared, e to the fourth, m, all over h squared, and then I'm going to pull out that 1 over n squared. And it's that 1 over n squared is what we saw in the equation at the very top of this. And here's a cool thing. If you plug in all the numbers for this, 
I'll tell you in the next one.